underwater video camera housings, and lighting is provided by Equinox Video Housings, the exclusive leader in underwater video housings for the professional, leisure, and sport divers. Hey everybody, welcome to another exciting episode of Talking Scuba. I'm your host, Bob Shoemaker. I'm Jim Norton. And we're going to talk about a couple of exciting things this week. You uh, oh, did yeah. an interview with a couple different people. Molly, first of all. Yep, Molly's going to be a great addition to Talking Scuba. Yeah, we're really excited to have uh, Molly Michelle on. And you can see her posts up on our website as well. Uh, where she's going to be doing a little blog. And, and she's just learning how to scuba dive. So we're pretty excited yep. to have her on the team. And, and she's actually a professional. Oh, yeah. And she, she said that she was thinking about doing some modeling of some of our antique gear as well. Yeah. That'll be. Well, that'll you guys be will like that. <laughs> And then you also did an interview with uh, our good buddy Lee Bishop. Sure did. What an outstanding gentleman. He has got some outstanding adventures from the UK, a little bit different waters than we're used to, and really quite a deep diver. I heard you got to dive this week. I did. One of my buddies at the marina lost an anchor. So they uh, talked me into going, putting the scuba gear on the sailboat and going. Nice. See Have you dove off the it. sailboat before? Nope, that was the first time. <laughs> it, uh, it worked pretty good. I kind of found a spot on the rail that I could, you know, do a back, uh, back roll back roll off from it. It's kind of got an awfully high freeboard, so it ended up being a head first thing. <laughs> but it, it, uh, I wish we had video worked. of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it would have been great. And uh, it, Muskegon Lake, the vi visibility is probably someplace around two feet. Yeah, nice. It was not nice at all. <laughs> So I, we had an idea of where it was. So we, I had him throw my anchor as close to where he thought his anchor was. Nice. And uh, I followed the anchor line down, got close to the bottom, and it kind of opened up a little bit. Visibility got up to, you know, somewhere around four foot. And so I could see a little bit. So I t brought a line with me and tied it to my anchor and then just played out, you know, 10 foot, did a sweep. And then I played out another 10 foot, did another sweep, and oh my God, I seen the line. And I went, oh, I found it already. It's only been you know, like three minutes. And I went over, swam over, and grabbed that line, and, and, and looked, and it's just like the line that was in my hand as my own line. So I kind of blew that. <laughs> Got excited for nothing. Found your own line. Yeah, it's the line that I was playing out. So I went about another 10 feet or so, uh, found a big log, and just past the log, I could see his rope. And it, it, so I found that and uh, started pulling on it. And actually, it had been in the, it had been lost for about four or five days before we had a chance to get out there. And it was pretty well buried. It was, it, I had to pull the line, got to the, where the chain is connected to the uh, anchor that helps hold them down. So day and forth. And when I, I picked that up, I'll bet you that anchor had sunk down in that sand probably four to five inches. Wow. And so did the anchor. Just so in a couple of days. Oh yeah. So if it wasn't, uh, wasn't for the line, there's no way we would have found it. Yeah. That's one of the fun, fun things to do in scuba diving and do a little uh, recovery diving. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, uh, let's uh, jump over to our interview that we did with Lee Bishop and uh, it was pretty fun, huh? Oh, it was great. Good. Yeah. We were down in Chicago for that. You all guys check it out. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another adventure of Talking Scuba. We're here in Chicago at Our World Underwater with Lee Bishop. And Lee is one of the foremost deep wreck photographers and divers. So how's it going, Lee? Yeah, it's good to be here, Jim, in Chicago, as ever. I love it at the uh, Our World Underwater exhibition. And uh, lovely people here, and the, the presentations are all packed out. And uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And. Uh Wait, I understand you've got over 40, 400 rather, virgin wrecks that you guys, you and your team have found. Well, well, during the 1990s, we, it was kind of in the early 90s when mixed gas really first came in, uh, into mainstream diving. Um, me and some colleagues in England, we were kind of the, like the first to start doing it. So all of a sudden it opened up a completely new world for us. So those wrecks that were like 150, 200 feet deep, all of a sudden, the wrecks deeper than that were accessible to us. So every weekend we went wreck diving, mainly in the English Channel, and there's like four and a half thousand known shipwrecks there. There's more shipwrecks per square mile in the English Channel than anywhere else in the world. So every weekend we would 
go and dive a new mark and it would turn out to be a shipwreck. And my dive partner and I, Chris Hutchinson, we estimated that we probably dived in the region of something like 400 virgin shipwrecks over those years. Yeah, it was the glory days. Well, it sounds like it. And you did some experimenting on, on the mixed gases as well. Yeah. Did you get any help at all from like the Navy people or anything like that? Or was this all pretty much uh, on your own? Um, no, it was um, in the early days, um, there was one or two instructors about it. There was a couple in England. Um, there was a guy called Kevin Gurr. And there was another guy called Rob Palmer, who was a, a friend of mine from the cave diving group. Because before I was a wreck diver, I was a cave diver. And before I was a cave diver, I was a, uh, when I left school and I was a teenager, I was a, I was a caver. So um, I knew Rob Palmer from the old cave di- caving days. So Rob taught me how to use mixed gas. But that was in the early infancy of it. That was when Billy Deans had Key West Diver back in 1988. And, um, and, you know, there was only two or three places you could go and get trained in mixed gas. There was like, you took the option to come over and see Sheck Exley in the States, go to Billy Deans's place. Failing that, in England, we had Rob Palmer and, and Kevin Gurr. But, yeah, we, uh, we got onto the bandwagon and, uh, and we taught ourselves as well. Back in those days, we had, uh, you couldn't buy reels. There was no rebreathers as such, not, not that were come of age. And a lot of the equipment we made ourselves, that was from the cave diving world, and it all worked perfect. It was not a problem. So, um, and, and another thing as well, there was um, some friends of mine from England, John Cordley and Russell Carter. They were going across to France and doing some cave diving with um, the French cave divers and a Swiss cave diver called Olivier Isler. And those guys were really on the bandwagon with mixed gas. So those guys came back from Europe and they said what they'd been doing. I said, well, look, tell me all about mixed gas diving. And they kind of said to me, well, you know, go away, go to the library, find out about it, and then we'll tell you more. Well, like an idiot, I went to the library to get a book on mixed gas diving. There was no such thing, was there? (laughs) But no, in those days, um, Bill Stone had just brought his book out on um, Wakulla Springs, the 1988 project. And in that, there was all sorts of things about mixed gas diving. That was the only thing you could get at the time. So we kind of taught ourselves a little bit, and I learned from Rob from what he had learned in the the blue holes with Bill Hamilton and and, and those guys. So that's how I kind of started. And once we'd got a grip of it, we just took it, and then we were away, and we were wreck diving. So... Yeah, as I just said, the glory days, yeah. Oh, that sounds great. All right. Uh, some of the shipwrecks that uh, you've uh, dove on, one of the ones that really intrigued me was the Egypt. Yeah. Pretty much because it was a treasure ship. Yeah. And everybody's interested in treasure ships. Yeah. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? And did you ever find anything on it? Well, you know, the Egypt, is like, like you said, it's a treasure ship wreck. And every single book that you will pick up on treasure, there's bound to be a chapter on that ship, the Egypt, the SS Egypt. Sank in 19, uh, 1922, I think it was. And, uh, you know, back then, um, it was carrying uh, $2 million worth of, of um, bullion. Um, and back in the 1920s, I don't, I dread to think what that, mu- what that would be worth now. And, and of course, um, back then, um, Lloyds of London that insured the ship wanted their money back. So they employed a company called Serima, an Italian company, to go and salvage the wreck. Now, the wreck is lost off the Bay of Biscay in France. That's that famous place where you see those, um, those lighthouses that are completely engulfed in the waves from the ocean. It's a really treacherous place to be. And the ship sank there. It was in collision with another ship. And they went looking for that gold. And it took them eight years to find the ship. And then it took them another four or five years to actually get the gold out of the ship. It sank on the seabed completely upright. And the bullion room was right at the the bottom. So they had to eat the ship away completely and get the gold. Now, that fascinated me, that story. And back then, they had an observation chamber. A little Italian guy went down. They communicated with the surface with a grab. And it was all interesting stuff. And no no sport divers had ever been to that wreck. Now, they did get 98% of the gold. That 2% that was left would probably, in today's money, be worth what they recovered back then. So it was always um, an option that we could find some gold. And no sport divers, no free-swimming sport divers had ever been to the wreck. So we kind of set out um, with a a ship called Loyal Watcher from England, a friend of mine, Richie Stevenson, and the Starfish Enterprise team. And we went across 2001, vintage year that was, for diving for us. And we went and we became the first sport divers to dive that wreck. Now, it was uh, a depth of something like 100 and, sorry, uh, 125 meters so in feet that's something like uh, 420 feet something like that 
and we were using open circuit scuba back then big cylinders on the back trimix everything and every time you breathed you could see the needle on your gauge go down and i remember one point my friend chris he looked at his gauge and it said 250 atmospheres of gas left five minutes later he looked at his gauge again and it said exactly the same the pressure was so vast on the on the on the glass it was pressing against the needle and stopping it from going around yeah pinhead. so you know we didn't have a great deal of exploration time and no we didn't find any gold <laughs> when i got home my mum the first thing she said did you find any gold why are you bothering going you know but it was fantastic to dive such a historic shipwreck oh, yeah. and since then we've dived a few more treasure shipwrecks as well and uh in fact um yeah my latest project uh, we're hoping to dive um, a treasure shipwreck off vietnam yeah, oh, so for the last year, my equipment's been in Vietnam working on this project. But yeah, interesting stuff. Oh, very interesting, very interesting. Here in these uh, Great Lakes, we're not allowed to take anything off the shipwrecks. So it's a little bit different for us to talk to you guys that do the oceans. And you're welcome to take anything you can get, don't you? aren't you? Yeah, we have a different thing. In England, we have uh, the receiver of wreck. And basically, everything is owned by somebody. Okay, so and a shipwreck is owned by somebody. Now, if you find a shipwreck and you take something off it for identification purposes, which normally if we find the bell or, or a helm or something like that, yes, we do take things off the wrecks. But you have to declare it to the receiver of wreck, and that's a government department. Okay, you have to legally do that. If you land it on British soil, you declare it. It's not illegal to take things. It's illegal to take things from um, classified wrecks and wrecks that you can't touch, wrecks that got preservation orders on them. However, other wrecks, yes, we do take things, and we are allowed to do that. And what happens then is we declare it to the receiver of wreck, and she has a duty, 101 days, sorry, a year and a day, to uh, find the rightful owner of that shipwreck and that artifact. And that, that owner would then ask for their artifact back, which is all fair and deal. But if she doesn't, and it's, you get to look after that piece of historical um, artifact. And if it is of a significant piece of artifact such as something a cannon or something like that then it's of significant interest to the state so it will go into a museum a lot of my stuff is in museums um, we had a lot of um, artifacts from a ship called the flying enterprise that went down in the 1950s very famous ship captain kirk colson two weeks headline news everywhere around the world and that went down and it and the ship was uh, the captain was brought back to a place called Falmouth in England, and the world's media descended on that town in 1952. It was the biggest thing in the media event, other than the coronation. And all my artifacts from that ship are in the museum at Falmouth, which is the rightful place for them to live. But yeah, that's the story with artifacts. So I may have one or two bells in my house. <laughs> Who knows? The, the receiver wreck in England, uh, Sophia, she, she has great delight in telling people she knows exactly what I've got in my house, so it's no secret. And if the, if the rightful owners want it back, they're welcome to it. Yeah, we'll probably have some more room in the house. <laughs> uh, you also have worked with uh, the uh, History Channel and uh, some other TV stuff. Can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, there was, uh, well, basically... Um, during the early days of wreck diving, a um, friend of mine, Polly Tapson, was the organiser of a team that we was involved with called the Starfish Enterprise. And her and a uh, friend, Christina, my, my good friend as well, they, they joined what was known as the Gary Gentile Fan Club back then. And they wrote to Gary and there were like, two girls in England. And basically they got a relationship with the American divers, the, the, our like-minded counterparts across the pond. And those guys included John Chatterton as well. And um, and over the years, we became good friends. And then um, uh, Richie Kohler came to England to look for U-boats um, in 1999. I met him on, on a di dive there, and we, we were obviously born out the same mould, and we were hit off straight away. So we've been good friends ever since. And then, of course, when those guys got the, um, the Deep Sea Detectives jobs, they called me up and said, look, can you write some stuff for us for some shows? It, you know, you've got some fantastic shipwrecks in England. Sure enough, we, we put some proposals together and, and they came and did some of that. But we've been to Britannic, Titanic sister ship as well. And we filmed that for National Geographic. We've also filmed it for History Channel. And um, we've done some other stuff as well, um, bits and bobs and uh, stuff on um, the uh, the Nazi ocean liner, the Wilhelm Gusloff in the Baltic Sea for National Geographic. But, you know, specialist stuff. And we've worked with a guy called Evan Kovacs. Evan's like the cameraman. Uh, he works for um, Woods Hole. So we use all those high-def cameras that are tethered to the surface on our project. So it's all big stuff where you crane it into the water. None of these little cameras that I'm looking at now, guys. 
Uh, Lee, I understand that you've got your own uh, dive show in Europe as well. Yeah, Jim, that's correct. Yeah, um, a dive show called Eurotech, uh, eurotech.uk.com. Listeners go to there, they'll find out more. Basically, it's a technical and advanced diving conference. We have divers from all around the world. We have over 40 speakers come in that specialize in advanced and, and technical diving for a weekend. It's biannual, so it's only every two years. And all you're going to see at that show is stands and exhibitors that are manufacturing technical and advanced diving equipment. It's every two years. We have it in England, in Europe, and um, we've got our own podcast that runs with the show as well. That can be downloaded from the iTunes web website as well, and it tells you all about technical and advanced diving. So, yeah, if any listeners are out there and they want to know more about technical diving, look on the internet, uatech.uk.com, and they will find the best show on planet Earth. Thank you. Well, thanks, you very, thanks very much, Lee, for uh, taking the time out and letting us do an interview with you. And... Uh, yeah, Good diving. You. Yeah, more than welcome. Yeah, it was a pretty cool interview with uh, Lee Bishop. It sure was. You got to know him uh, pretty well over the weekend. Oh, yeah. He yep. was giving you some... Uh... He gave me some pointers. Yeah. <laughs> so I got a little nervous. Yeah. And uh, so, again, we were down at Our World Underwater. Stay through the credits because uh, I think he uh, we play some of the footage. Yep. We that sure did. Uh, he was picking on you about. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Good. So... Next, we're going to go jump into our interview that we you did also yep. with uh, Molly Michelle out on your boat. Out on the sailboat, you bet. So cool. We'll, we'll jump into that. There, we're safe. Hello, everybody. This is Jim Norton with Talking Scuba. I'm out on my sailboat today, a great day to be sailing. And we have a guest today. Molly Michelle. Did I get that right, Molly? You did. All right. And uh, Molly's going to join us here at Talking Scuba and do some stuff for us. What, what, what brings you to Talking Scuba? Well, I have always wanted to know how to scuba dive, and I also have a background in on-air hosting stuff. So when I found that there was an opportunity to do both, I just jumped on it. Great. Um, so you're going to learn to scuba dive with us. Uh, you're going to blog that uh, how are you? Let, let everybody know what's going on with that? Mm -hmm. um, I also have some experience with writing and blogging and whatnot. I already have a blog. And so when I learn how to scuba dive, I'm also going to be doing a blog so people can follow along and see my journey and what I've done and how I've learned how to do it. Okay, so uh, Bob and Jim Dive Shop's going to be training you to do this scuba diving. You're going to be uh, taking your first classes here next week, I understand, right? Yes. Great. So uh, we'll get you going on that and get you some local dives in, mostly at the lakes. Maybe we'll do some shipwreck divings towards the end of the year, get you up to the straits. And uh, so what else have you done um, related to uh, videos? Oh gosh, I have done a lot of stuff. I was the, yeah, I was the hostess of Michigan Film Reel for about a year. Um, I was also an intern at Curtis Productions in Chicago, and that was all of last semester. Um, and mainly I just do a lot of acting in the Grand Rapids area, some modeling stuff, um, but my passion is definitely in on-air stuff and in acting. Great, so you're not going to really put Bobby and me to shame, are you? <laughs> I guess we'll see. Time will tell. <laughs> well, it's not hard to do, that's for sure. Okay, Molly, I understand that the guys have talked you into doing some modeling of some vintage gear. Is that true? <laughs> yes. From what I understand, they have some vintage gear that I haven't seen yet, so who knows what it looks like. I'm not really quite sure, but they are going to get me into that gear, and then I'm going to be modeling that and uh, trying it out, so we'll see how it goes. Oh, great. So maybe you'll actually get some dives with that gear on as well. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. That'll be great. Maybe we could do the whole show underwater. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> that was great, Molly. And we hope to see more of you, especially in the uh, the models, modeling of the gear, and uh, definitely reading the blog. I think it'll be great to follow you your blog on the training. That'll be interesting. It will definitely be interesting. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a good time. And it'll be, I'm looking forward to doing some dives with you. And... Uh, I think we ought to do some more sailing. I, I agree. I agree. There you go. This is what I want you to take. Oh. <laughs> I'm going down below and getting a beer. In? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't hit that big cement thing. Yeah, there we go. I think Molly's going to be a great addition to our team. She is, and she's a lot better looking than you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going for my Jim Norton look. I'm trying to I grow it that. up. It's yeah. a slow process, so this is about a month. 
No. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we're really excited to have you on board, Molly. Thanks for stopping by. And uh, we'll see her in a, a bunch more episodes. Yep. She's going to be blogging and stuff for us as well. She's learning yeah. how to scuba dive now, She's so. going to blog about her experience scuba diving. Yep, as she learning. learns how to do it. And, stuff, so. and beyond that, we also have the Haveman family. Uh, they're blogging, Renee and Jeff. Great. They're blogging and talking about family diving uh, with Renee. And then, and then uh, Jeff is talking about equipment. Sure. So that's pretty cool. And then uh, we also have our tech blog now with uh, Jeff Fosmo. So Great. very exciting stuff we got going on uh, in the Talking Scuba blogging world. Great. Also, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and all that fun stuff because we always have updates. And we're going to start having a lot more uh, shirts and T-shirts and stuff. We just came up with a really cool new design. I see that. You guys so, kind of stole my idea. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so we're going to have uh, we're going to have that on our uh, website. You can buy a T-shirts and stuff. And also look in your local dive shops for all of our stuff. We're going to start selling to uh, dive shops so you guys can see us all over the place and uh, help support the cause. There you go. And by the way, drop us a line. A little email once in a while. Let us know if we're doing good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah. And uh, the bad ones, you can send those right to Jim at talking-scuba.com. Or, or, or Johnny B. Or Johnny B. Johnny loves those. Johnny things. likes the bad ones. Yep, yep. I like all the love letters. So for all you beautiful ladies out there, uh, you can send those to Bob at talking-scuba.com. And I'm excited Late, to hear from those girls. Ladies this time. <laughs> that's all we have time for this week we're really excited to have you here on talking scuba and we will see you next week for the next dive the next dive cheers where's your beer i forgot my beer <laughs> big dummy i didn't bother you when i said that did no. <laughs> no okay <laughs> come on oh i think i pissed him off no. <laughs> I knew it was going to be this way. Hello everybody, this is Jim from Talking Scoop. We're here with Britain's foremost wreck diver, Lee Bishop. Lee, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, sir. It's been a wonderful time. Uh, Lee, uh, Lee, I've got some really good questions for you. Now, how did you get into wreck? You can't answer that. Do you want me to do your job for you? Would you please? Do you want me to be Lee as well and Jim? Oh, do it, do it. It'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you ready? 